In today's video, we're going to be learning this basic wallpaper or looping animation such as this. If you search for neon ball wallpaper, you're going to find some variation of this all over the internet. So why not learn how to make your very own customized to your preferences? In our default scene, we're going to use geometry nodes, so we won't delete the default cube. Instead, we'll bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to add in a new window, and change the window type from 3D viewport to geometry node editor. Then we can press new to add in a new geometry node tree, and find Finally, delete the default cube by selecting the group input and tapping X to delete it. Then we can press Shift A and search for a grid node, which is going to act as the plane on which all of our spheres are going to lie. So we can plug it up and change the size on the X and Y to something like 10 units. Now we need to distribute a bunch of points on which we are going to instance these spheres. So we'll press Shift A and search for a distribute points on faces node. Plug that in here, change it from random to Poisson disk, and we can play with the distance min to get fewer and fewer spheres to appear. The reason why we're using Poisson Disk and not random is because random, even if we do decrease the density, there is always the chance that they're going to clump together like this. And when we have the spheres or the balls, we don't want them to be touching each other. And hence, we can change it to Poisson Disk and use this to instance our spheres. So now we can press Shift A and search for an instance on points node and just plug that in here. And for the instance, we can press shift A and search for an icosphere. Now, the reason I'm using an icosphere and not a UV sphere is that I can change the subdivisions as and when I want just with one button. You can very well use a UV sphere, use subdivision surface nodes and play around however you please. I'm going to increase the subdivisions all the way to six so that we get these nice smooth spheres. And I'm going to reduce the radius to 0.1 unit. So now we have our spheres, but we need them to lie on some plane. So I'm just going to add in a ground plane. And to do that, I'll press Shift A and search for a joint geometry node so that we can have both the ground as well as the spheres. Plug that in right here. And then just take this grid and plug that into the joint geometry node. Now the problem is that the grid is clearly slicing the balls in half. So to make the ball rest on this, we can move the balls up by 0.1 units because the radius is 0.1 units. So to do that, we'll just press Shift A and search for a set position node, and then we'll place the set position in between the distribute points on faces and the instance on points node. So that way the points on which the icospheres will get placed will get shifted up by 0.1 units. So we can just plug that in right here from the distribute points on faces to the instance on points, and then just increase the Z value to the radius of the spheres, which is 0.1. Now, of course, if the sphere radius was a bit larger, like 0.2, you'd have to make this 0.2 as well, but I'll leave it at 0.1 for now. Next, if you actually zoom in close to the spheres, you can actually see the individual faces. Although a subdivision surface of level six makes it really hard to notice, it still is visible. So to fix that, we'll press Shift A and search for a set smooth node. And this set shade smooth has to be placed right over here. And with that, you can actually decrease the subdivisions to five or even four if your PC cannot handle it. Now that we have all of these spheres set, we have to give a random rotation to these spheres because when we actually add in the material, we don't want all of them to be oriented in the same way. So to make the rotations very random, we can press Shift A and search for a random value node and change it from float to vector so that we get rotations on all of the axes. I'll change the min values to minus pi. So Shift, click and drag to select all three of these that changing one of them changes it to all of them. I'll type in minus pi. And then for the max, I'll type in pi. And then I can just plug this value into the rotation. Now you don't see any of the rotations because there are perfect spheres. But when we add in the actual texture, we'll be able to see the difference. So we have to actually set the materials for our spheres here. What I'll do is I will just select these, bring them down, press control J to add in a new frame go to the node block here and label it as spheres so that people who are using the blend file from Patreon can understand exactly what each of the node groups are doing so that they can play around with it better. Then press Shift A and search for a set material node, plug it in right after the instance on points node, and then change this to material. Then we can actually go to the material properties over here, change the name of material to spheres. And also, since we need another floor material, we can press plus to add in a new material slot, and then press new to add in a new material and name this one as floor. Now we can press Shift A and search for a set material node, plug that in here and change it to floor. With that, we can move on to all of our animation and render defaults. 
So we'll go to our render properties, switch on Bloom and screen space reflections. Now for Bloom, there's actually quite a few settings that we're going to have to play around with. So we'll do that once we actually add in the colors. Then we'll go to the, our output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. The end frame can be 150 so that it's a five second long animation. The output can be set to wherever you want it to be with a file format of FFmpeg video. And for that, under the encoding, you have to change the container to MPEG4 with an output quality of perceptually lossless. Then we can take our camera by selecting it in our 3D viewport or selecting it from the outliner, pressing Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation, and then rotating it on the X axis by 90 degrees, and then just grabbing it on the Z axis by a little amount. Maybe we'll go with 0.1 initially. We might change that later on. And then grabbing it on the Y by minus five units so that it comes to the beginning of this particular grid. Then we can press zero to enter the camera view and you can see it is too low. So I'll grab it on the Z axis by another 0.2 units so that it moved up by a total of 0.3 units. Now I'm going to rotate it on the X axis by just about minus 10 degrees and also grab it on the Z axis by another 0.2 units so that we moved it up by a total of 0.5. Now under our camera settings, we can go down and expand the viewport display and increase passport out all the way to one so that we don't see anything outside what's going to be rendered. And we can finally change our viewport to rendered and select the default light and hit delete to remove it. Now we can start with the actual materials. So the first thing we'll do is change our geometry node editor window to the shader editor and then we'll just select the default cube so that we have all the materials show up. We can go to the material slots over here to select which material we want to work with. But first we'll work with the spheres and the first thing we'll do is actually add in these rings. So to do that we'll press shift A and search for a wave texture and we'll control shift click it with the node wrangler switched on to see how it is. And this is why we added in the random rotations because now you see how each sphere is getting the rings in a random rotation. Now we don't want it to be this many so we can just reduce the scale all the way to maybe 0.5 and then press shift A to search for a color ramp and just plug that in after the wave texture. Then we can bring the black in and bring the white in as well, just like that. And along with that, I think I'm gonna play with the phase offset just to bring it in. Maybe I can increase the scale to maybe 0.75. I'll bring the phase offset to maybe minus one, just so that we don't have a light on top and we have two strips that go like this. So this seems all right. Of course, I might play around with these later just before rendering. However, this is what's gonna drive the strength of the emission. So we can press Shift A and search for a math node so that we can get values much greater than one as well. And we have to change it from add to multiply and then increase the value to something like 10 or even 50 because we will need it much brighter later on and we can plug this into the emission strength. Now we can control shift click the principal BSDF to see the principal BSDF, but we won't see anything because the emission color is still black. So to make the emission color be the multicolored variation that you saw, we can first increase it to white just to see what we have and then press shift A and search for a gradient texture. Then we can press Ctrl T to actually preview it. Of course, the node wrangler has to be enabled. And you see the gradient is happening for each sphere individually, but we want it for the entire scene. So we can select the gradient texture and press Ctrl T again with the node wrangler switched on to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes, or you can add them in manually and you can change it from generated to object. Of course, you could use camera as well, but if we use camera, I'm gonna have to play around with the actual scale values and location values here but I think it's just easier to do it with an empty. So I'll press Shift A and search for an empty plane axis, and it's just gonna be present here. Now with this object selected, for the object, I can actually select the empty. So now we see how the gradient works. Then I can press Shift A and search for a color ramp, plug that in right here and select the black slider, change the color from black all the way to white and give it maybe this pinkish hue. Then for this side, I can select the white and then give it this reddish hue. And I'm gonna change the type from RGB to HSV. And then I'm gonna change this from near to counterclockwise so that it goes all the way from the pink to the blues, the turquoises, the greens, the yellows, the oranges, and then the reds. However, clearly the gradient is way too small. So to fix it, we're gonna select the empty and just scale the empty up by pressing S and scaling it up. And then I can press GX and just bring it towards the left and then scale it down again, just so a little bit of the red is also seen. And I think this sort of a gradient seems nice. Now that I have that, again, select my geometry node object, place this color into the emission color in the principal BSDF, and then control shift click the principal BSDF to see what we have. Now, 
clearly the bloom is taking over so we can now play around with the bloom settings by just clamping it to something like four and that seems all right for now however i want this to be so bright that these areas become completely white so to do that we'll just increase the multiply value even higher so let's go to 250 and now yeah all of them are white but they're emitting blue light yellow light and so on which seems nice i'm also just going to bring this slider out to the edge the white po portion so that we have this nice transition with the actual color coming in towards the edges i really like that so i'm going to leave it like that for now then I'm going to go ahead and increase the metallic value for the areas that are not emissive so that they get reflections from the floor again. So the metallic value may be 0.9 and the roughness I'm going to reduce to 0.4. After that, I can actually change from object to world and then change this from a gray all the way to black. Switch off overlays by toggling this button so that we see a much better preview of what we're going to actually render. Now press shift A and search for a volume scatter node and plug that into the volume of the world output. This way, the spheres that are there at the back will not be visible, which will help us loop the animation later on. We'll reduce the density for now to something like 0.3 and we might play around with this later. Remember, the more the density is, the more this color gets changed from white back to its original color. So be aware of that. Then we can actually play around with the floor. So let's change from the world back to object and go to the material properties and change the floor. Now for the floor, I'm just going to increase the metallicness again, all to maybe 0.8 and reduce the roughness to maybe 0.3 initially. That seems all right, but I want some texture to the roughness. So I'll press shift A and search for a noise texture and plug that into a color ramp so that we have more control plug the color into the factor, increase the scale because I know it's 10. So I'm going to have to increase it, maybe 10. A control shift click the color ramp so that you can actually see it. Of course, Node Wrangler needs to be enabled for control shift click to work. If you don't have Node Wrangler enabled, you can directly just connect the color ramp to the surface of the material output manually. However, I'm going to bring the black in, bring the white in, increase the scale even more, maybe go up to 50 per se, bring the white in. Now I'm going to change the black color from a value of zero to a value of 0 0.2 maybe. And this white value, I'm going to reduce the value from 1 to 0 0.6. And then I'm also going to press plus to get a new slider. Just to drag that middle slider out to the other edge, bring this in and reduce this one's value even lower to maybe 0 0.1. Now with that, I can plug that into the roughness and then control shift click the principled BSDF to actually see what it looks like. Now this is fine, but I think I'm going to have to increase the scale even more. And along with that, maybe just increase the detail to 5 and the roughness to 0 0.7. So those are really up to you, but just adding a little bit of variation always helps. Play around with it till you're happy with what you have. Once you're done with that, you can actually start off with the animation. So the first thing that we'll do is actually select the cube that we had or our geometry node object. That's zero to go out of our camera view and then just press Alt D Y 10 because the grid was 10 units long so that you get a duplicate and we're using Alt D so that it's an exact instance. And then just press Shift R to repeat the process maybe two more times or you can do it five times just to be safe for now and we'll delete the extra ones later on. Now let's switch off overlays and go back to zero. Now we can expand our timeline a little bit, go back to frame zero, select our camera and press I location, and then go to frame 150, press G Y 10, because again, we instanced it every 10 units because the size of the grid was 10. Now press I location, then come down here, press T linear, and that way it won't slow down and stop and you'll get a perfectly smooth looping animation. Now you can toggle between frame 150 and frame zero. And if it looks the exact same, that means it's perfectly looping. And you can zoom in right to the edge to make sure that nothing seems to be clipping off between 150 and zero. Now, yeah, there is a little bit of a clip off. So there's actually one thing that I'm going to do, which is increase the density of the volume scatter node because that way lesser of these final spheres will be seen and I don't actually want so many to be seen. So I'm going to change from object to world over here. And if I can't find the nodes, just press A to select the nodes and then press period on your numpad to actually centralize those nodes. Now just increase the density to maybe 0 0.5 and that seems great. But again, our spheres start losing that whiteness, but I want a few more of them to be white. So I'll go back to object, select this cube and change from floor to spheres, go down to the multiply node and increase it to maybe 1000 or I've gone up to 10,000 and that looks much better. Finally, I can again zoom right into the top 
toggle between frame 150 and 0 and see if there's any changes. And now you can see that there's absolutely no change. So that's great. Now I'm going to go to frame 150 and just hide cube 4. And yeah, there was a few spheres that disappeared, which means cube 4 is necessary. If I saw that there was no spheres disappearing, I could have deleted cube 4 as well. And if I do increase the volume scatter a little bit more, I might do that. However, before rendering, the final touches that I want to do is go to my render properties, go all the way down to color management and actually change the view transform look from none to very high contrast or just medium high contrast and play around with it till you get something that you like. Because sometimes on none, because of the bloom, everything seems to be washed off. So you could play with the bloom intensity and things like that, reduce this to 0 0.3, or you could increase the view transform, play around with the gamma and make those changes until you get something that you like. So with those changes, the file will be available on Patreon. And, and with that, all you have to do is press render animation. Hopefully you learned something from this particular tutorial and you can create amazing results. Remember, it doesn't even have to be spheres. You could do this with anything and you're going to get really cool results. Have fun playing around with it and be sure to check out other tutorials on my channel. If you have any comments or questions, let me know down below and I'll respond to all of them for as long as I can until the next video comes out, which is going to be tomorrow. Keep creating and stay creative.